Uh, welcome. We are going to be discussing the Amida, which um, I, we, we talked about it last week and read an article about it last time. And now what I've been doing um, for the last couple of days is going through a couple of texts. And we're actually going to look at the text of the Amida uh, carefully and uh, and you know as in the same manner that we've studied texts from you know other books of the Bible because it is such a central prayer you know as the the um, I think as our discussion went last time it um, it is the it is the prayer that took the place of animal sacrifice so if I always say if we were worshiping two thousand years ago the way biblical Jews would worship would be at the temple in Jerusalem uh, where animals would be sacrificed three times a day. And so with the destruction of the temple, uh, the, um, the rabbis decided to replace the three times repetition of the Amidah uh, with, uh, with animal sacrifice. And um, in one of the books, and I'll, I'll show it to you as I start the PowerPoint that I have as a source for this, it was a pretty interesting discussion. I have to admit, I hadn't really thought about it. But if you go back to the era, you know, just following the destruction of the temple, so we're talking first, sec second century common era, there weren't, <coughs> there weren't a lot of prayer books around. Um, writing was on animal skins, as we know from Torah scrolls. And uh, in one of the uh, one of the sources I read, they said to write sort of a modern style prayer book would take the skin of about, I think, 80 or, or 100 sheep. So it would be, you know, quite an, an, uh, quite a task. And they, they estimated, at least in this, in this text, that only about 2 or 3% of Jews were literate. Clearly, the rabbis and the scribes would have been literate, but the average Jew would not necessarily know how to read. So these prayers really begin as um, as memorized, and there's a whole discussion, you know, which which I'm not going to get into. I mean, if you really want to study this uh, in a scholarly way, um, that there's a lot of material out there, but it, but it becomes um, they're really prayers that were memorized, such as in the same way that the Mishnah and and a lot of material were were, were oral and memorized, and the rabbis would put a structure to it. Um, but they don't really get fixed for quite a while, and and it's it, it it's really interesting. I must admit, I just hadn't um, hadn't thought about that in detail. Certainly, did not have access. Well, I've only had this book for twenty five years. It doesn't mean I've read it carefully. Um, so that's another uh, part of this. Uh, yeah, Alan, I wanted to mention a uh, since Tisha B'Av is uh, around the corner, and you are talking about the destruction of the temple that uh, I'll put in the chat, there's a, a new film that came out. Uh, it's entitled um, The Legend of Destruction. And I didn't see the movie yet, but I heard the producer uh, talk about it. And so for people yeah, who might be interested I, in I that. think Tisha B'Av is Wednesday, starting Tuesday. Let's see. So, just, it's it's soon. It. But anyway, I'll put the link in there. And apparently uh, it's you have to apply or somehow get access oh, no. to the video but there's no no charge in general the way i understood it but again i haven't seen yeah, it yet no 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 it's tisha B'Av is is um is august 13th okay yeah, the, yeah. it should be yeah. late and sure. tisha B'Av means the ninth day of the month of av and it's the day in which jewish tradition teaches that both the first temple was destroyed the second temple was destroyed um, the Jews were expelled from Spain. All kinds of terrible things happened uh, on that day. Uh, Bryce. Yeah, I got a question. I, I realized that it's it's necessary because of the destruction of the temple for the uh, for the the people of Israel to stop worshiping. I mean, because of King Josiah centralizing all worship and then making making a decree that no jew could worship anywhere else and and so that the rabbis would have had to substitute but simply because 
it is a necessity does not mean that there would be a holy, um, an imprinture, a holy, uh, that it would be okay by the lights. Okay, it doesn't say that okay you can just change. I, I don't know well, what I mean by that is that that, um, that that just because you gotta do it doesn't mean that it's okay with God. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. So, 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 so I, I, how is it that it's okay for the rabbis to just pull a rabbit out of a hat? Yes. And uh, so forth. Yes. So the question I often put it as: How do the rabbis have the chutzpah to yes. reform Judaism? Yes. And uh, just to even put a, a more detailed historical spin on it, um, you know, if you go back before King Josiah, there were lots of different places where where altars were built and Jews could sacrifice. And I think, you know, we talked about this, maybe we talked about it in one of these classes, that, you yeah. know, Abraham builds a, builds an altar, Jacob builds an altar, lots of altars are built. Well, they build an altar every time something nice happens, they name right. the place after it. Right. And then, um, and then um, it, it appears, you know, archaeologically, some of these altars have been uncovered. Uh, so, so it is clear that there were many places for, that the that the people could sacrifice to God, and then in uh, you know in King Josiah's time, a book of the Torah is discovered, and and that discussion of the book of the Torah being discovered is in I think it's it's in the Book of Kings, um, um, and. And and that results in the centralization of worship. Uh, the Torah itself doesn't mention Jerusalem, of course, because that would be an anachronism. Yes. Because in the time of Moses, Jerusalem was not, uh, you know, occupied, and and um, so so the book of of Deuteronomy, which is this book that that scholars believe that King Josiah uh, found, there's a lot of reference, and the language is you will you will only sacrifice in the place. Where where I will cause my name to dwell. This is what God is is saying. So and of course the rabbis are going to interpret that and the priests are going to interpret it as being the temple in Jerusalem and centralization of worship. So the so the qu first question number one is where does the chutzpah to centralize worship come from? And the answer is it's a found book of the Torah, and at least you know it's plausible to say that the the Israelites believed that that was you know part of the God given Torah, but the the more interesting question is where do and you know the one you raised Bryce is where do the rabbis get the chutzpah to really change Judaism dramatically? It becomes a uh, a change from a a sacrificial based system to one not only on reciting this prayer but prayer in general. Mm -hmm. um, um, to, everyone's home becomes what is called a mikdash me'at. Mikdash means a temple, and me'at means small. That laws like kosher laws and and having two challahs on Friday night and putting salt on them and washing your hands before eating and all of these things, which really are tied back to the temple worship, become practices that we do in every home. Um, and um, obeying, you know. Uh, lots of commandments, more than what is in the in the Bible, and studying Torah becomes the central activity of of Judaism. And the answer, where do they get the chutzpah, is is the oral law. So the the, the teaching is that when Moses was on Sinai, Moses got two revelations, one written, one oral, and the you know in to putting it. In great summary, and even a little flip, flippantly, that you know what to do in case the temple falls is contained in the oral law. Now, whether historically that took place, I actually don't know. Don't know even how much you know archaeology there is or or scholarly work there is. But clearly, by the time of the rabbis and with the destruction of the temple, the rabbis had a set of oral texts which guided them on how to continue Judaism um, as rabbinic Judaism. 
And, you know, and, and when I talk about this, I often say that they could have built another temple somewhere else. They could have said, okay, and in fact, there's some evidence, I think in Elephantine um, uh, Egypt, uh, that that another temple might have been built. And the rabbis could, could have said, or the priests could have said, well, this is where God is causing his name to dwell now. So, it, I mean, it could have gone in, in lots of different ways, but that's where they get the chutzpah. They get the chutzpah by understanding that this actually was God's will. And uh, if you're done with that question, you can lower your hand and I'll call oh, on Alan. Sorry. Alan. Uh, me? Uh, sure. So I, I wouldn't use the word chutzpah. I would use uh, words like passion and inspiration. But but I think the, the physical events, uh, you could make historical uh counterparts in lots of things what's going through my mind besides the destruction of the temple and how the uh, the um, Jewish leaders decided to go in the direction we know as rabbinic Judaism I would use um, the effects of the enlightenment so Judaism in the at the end of the 18th century thanks to the French Revolution the impact on, <laughs> on Judaism evolved into some of the things that we know now such as reform judaism and conservative judaism but so this these events are the driving force and the uh survival attitudes that uh, this was a valuable thing to maintain judaism <coughs> using those examples are not chutzpah in my opinion <laughs> okay and uh, what i would say is in both cases the question arises, how are we going to continue to be Jewish in light of changing mm -hmm. world situations? Um, the other thing I'll mention is that, and I'm pretty sure this is Maimonides saying, that this, was del this concept was deliberately planted by God. And what he meant is, in theory, the Bible, the Torah could have said, no animal sacrifice. We will just study these texts and here are the prayers. I mean, there's a lot of material. And so pray them. And what Maimonides said was that would have been a radically different way to pray. And, you know, nobody prayed like that. So it, it wouldn't have caught on. I'm, I'm editorializing here. So what, what Maimonides would say is God gave us a system which God knew would be obsolete. Namely, this form of Judaism is tied to a physical building in Jerusalem, and someday it's going to be destroyed. So God understood that animal sacrifice, slavery, many other things that you find in biblical Judaism eventually will uh, will stop, and we will move on to these other uh, these other uh, techniques. So he's he is analyzing it. I would say from a pious point of view rather than a a practical point. And that would include, in my opinion, the evolution of egalitarian treating women and men equally yeah. over, over the millennia also, which it could have happened sooner, right? But it didn't. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes, uh, except I would say, you know, not all the, not all the Jewish movements have developed the way reform developed and egalitarian movements have developed and Judaism still survived. Whereas I don't believe any Jewish movements embracing daily sacrifice survived anywhere. Uh, Helen, Helena, sorry. Yeah, I, instead of using chutzpah, I would use creative and divine inspiration when you're, um, and so, you know, I, I don't believe that God wrote the Torah you know, in, but I do believe in divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. in, in, I think the rabbis were faced with, well, what are we going to do now? Yes. Yeah. How? And I think it, it was very, they, it's so many different aspects of life they looked at. You know, like you say, you know, the, the, the prayers or uh, the Shabbat, the Hala, the, what you could wear, what you, how many things they looked at yeah. is really sort of amazing, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call first on Erwin and then Bryce. Erwin. Uh, in the Torah, uh, the, at the last day of Moses' life, uh, he 
tells the Israelite that every seven years, somebody has to read the Torah to them. In the, it, it is written in, in the Torah. And I also, I, I don't know where I read it, but when the, the rabbis were in Babylon, I read that in Bet Din, uh, the students had to learn uh, a certain part of the Torah orally. And uh, when they started writing down the Torah, those students had to recite what they learned. And yeah, that's so, cool. so, so, um, you know, the the recitation of the Torah is is definitely part of the written tradition. I don't remember exactly where and when and who delivers that. I think what you're describing about memorizing is oral Torah, not written Torah. Yeah, oral um, Torah. Yeah. And and so, um, the tradition teaches. I'm choosing my words very carefully. The tradition teaches that the oral Torah was always to remain oral and never to be written down. And there were memory geniuses uh, in, in these rabbinic academies. Uh, and, you know, different people were assigned different sections to memorize. Nobody could memorize at all. And uh, in the year 200 of the Common Era, uh, the leading rabbi of the time, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, uh, said that if we don't write this down, it's going to be lost. Because in the year 200, it was after the unsuccessful revolt against Rome in the year 70, and the unsuccessful Bar Kokhba revolt in the year 135. And if you don't have these memory geniuses meeting regularly and discuss it and keep it alive, it's going to be lost. So Yehuda Hanasi uh, writes what he believes is the most important part of the oral law in a book called the Mishnah, and uh, if you actually keep track of, of all the elements of oral law, the Mishnah is about one-sixth of the total oral law that, that actually gets written down. And for the next three or four hundred years, the rabbis discuss the Mishnah, and that's ultimately what the Talmud is. There's a central core of, Talmud, of Mishnah, and then pages and pages and pages for each Mishnah uh, discussion called Gemara. And and then at, at some point, toward the end of that process, certainly in Babylon, somebody writes down the whole thing. Uh, so it, it all gets a written uh, price. Yeah, so I think my point was was kind of not really understood. And, and I think you got it. All right. But I but a couple of other people commented and they're talking about creativity or or that kind of thing. But the real point is. That God says in the Torah, or at least, you know, if you if that's what you believe, mm -hmm. God says in the Torah, you do this where I tell you to do it. That's right. it. And and he doesn't doesn't say, or oh, you could do some prayer. Right. You know, right. you could pray, or you could have, you know, some cake, right. you know. You can't in the written, do that. In the written Torah. Exactly. So so it is chutzpah. It is bold, okay, to turn around and say, hey, everybody out there that has grown up in this idea of the only way to reach God is to put the sins on an animal and send it, burn it up and send it to God. And that's what God's expecting. Right. And to turn around and tell everybody, change a plan. That is courageous. Yes. And I would say they, they, they only had the courage to do that because they had the oral law. And the right. oral law, and they they treated the oral law as given to Moses on Sinai, and that was the big political debate between uh, the the uh, the Pharisees, who were the rabbis, and the, and the Sadducees, who was sort of the priestly group. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine a um, you know a upset Sadducee. Uh, I think his name was Jay Lieberman at the time. Asking <laughs> the Pharisees oh, about the oral this. law, saying, "Who wrote this?" <laughs> um, Alan, you're muted, Alan. Sorry, the way Bruce Bryce just uh, uh, described this, I would replace the word um, chutzpah with heresy. 
Well, it's only heresy if you go against God's laws. But in yeah. Jewish tradition, according to the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees would say it's heresy. It, the, the, fa the Pharisees said, no, we actually have an oral Torah, which doesn't violate the, the written Torah, but it explains how we keep this tradition alive. Okay. And okay. so, so yeah, I, I actually like chutzpah because I'm not sure I'm convinced that the story of Moses actually getting an oral Torah uh, is historically correct. And I don't know, I really ought to ask some of my scholar, scholar buddies what scholars believe about how the oral Torah evolved. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, which shows there is no end to these classes. Um, you know, we can just keep going. Okay, but we are going to go to the Amidah right now. And I trust you can see the screen. And even beyond that, you can see the, uh, you know, the normal presentation. So Amidah, a text study. So the book I mentioned is... Um, is, you know, is this one. There's actually a series called My People's Prayer Book. Um, and I don't know if you can read it, but this is volume two. I think there's about nine or 10 volumes in this about different prayers. Um, so there's one, well, anyway, there's, you know, I think the first one is on the Shema. The second one is on the Amidah. I don't, I, I, I think I will find out. Yeah, I, well, anyway, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the other ones are, um, but but it but it's a wonderful collection, um, and so this is you know not a huge book, but a but a but a, a good resource, focusing only on the Amidah, published by Jewish Lights Publishing, which no longer exists. I don't know if this book is in print or out of print, um, and the thing I wanted to show you, and I don't expect you to read this, is the way the book is laid out, uh, and it's it's edited by. Uh, Rabbi Lawrence Hoffman, who is a professor of liturgy, I think he's probably emeritus or retired now, he's a retired. professor of liturgy at HUC retired. in New York. Um, and he actually lays out the book like a page of Talmud. Um, and based, so you have text here. This is just Adonai Sefetai Tiftach, Ufi Yagi Tehila Tacha. This is kind of the opening meditation of the Amidah. And what he has here is, no, I can't, I can't zoom in. So he has different scholars, and they comment on every element of the Amidah. So you have Mark Brettler, who is commenting on this phrase as it relates to the Bible. We have Elliot Dorf, who is a, you know, a, a, a conservative theologian, uh, commenting on uh, the theology. We have David Ellenson commenting on modern literature and prayer books. We have um, Marsha Falk, who is a feminist, commenting on a feminist perspective on every one of these elements. We have uh, Hauptman, I, I remember Hauptman's first name, commenting on Talmud. We have Larry Kushner and an, one, another scholar commenting on Kabbalah. We have a, a scholar commenting on Jewish law. We have another scholar commenting on the history. That's actually uh, Larry Hauptman. And then his son, uh, is commenting on translation issues. And of course, you might think that this would be it, but this this commentary for just one line, Adonai Sefetai Tiftach Ufi Yogi goes on for three pages. And so for some elements of this prayer, there might be 10 or 15 pages of commentary. So if you like that stuff, this is the book for you. If you don't like that stuff, you will be asleep in 20 minutes. So you might want to <laughs> prepare yourself. There's an, another book on my bookshelf, which is Jewish Liturgy, A Comprehensive History by uh, Ismar Ellenbogen. And uh, he, actually, he actually comments on what we were just discussing. So here is a comment taken from this first book on page 27. This book was originally published in German in 1913, and he did his study of the history of liturgy, uh, quote, committed to the view that Judaism had survived because of its continual evolution, had prevented it from fossilizing 
into irrelevance. He dedicated himself to charting its development in the past and then directing its full evolution as the ever spiritual lifeblood of the Jewish people. So I, I think that's that's very similar to the discussion we just had. And I think it points up what for me is a, is a very important element, and that is religions keep changing and evolving. And religions, and I'll you know, focus on Judaism, of course, but Judaism is, it, is very much influenced not only by the crisis of the day, namely the destruction of the temple, as, as we're talking about, you know, a moment ago, and the Bar Kokhba revolt and other problems, but also it's influenced by are we living in Spain? Are we living in, you know, in, in Muslim lands? Uh, the, the influences of, of cultures in which we live and, you know, as, as Alan pointed out, with the Enlightenment in, in France and Germany, that greatly influenced Judaism, and a new movement, Reform Judaism, develops out of it, and feminist Judaism develops out of the time. So, so, so I think there's a, an image that's easy to have that is Judaism is the religion that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, and and that's pretty much it. We may change because we're getting away from it, but but it's not true. I mean, Judaism evolves and changes, and I think all religions evolve and, and change. This is, uh, it's actually, a, 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 I copied it from the book, and it's not a great copy. This is kind of a, an overview of a morning service. That would, actually would be a morning service where the Torah is read, and traditionally Torah is read on Shabbat, on uh, on Mondays and Thursdays, and also holidays. Uh, let's see, before I dive into it, Alan. I have a question about the the implication or the the thinking about the Messiah. So some of, I'm trying to articulate a question that says, when, when Judaism evolves, um, the leaders keep in mind different factors like protecting the oral law and the written law but where does the thinking when you ask the question where is judaism going okay one could answer well eventually we'll reach what we hope will be the messianic era but but my question is how do we think about this in the looking future well and and you know one element to answering your question is Judaism is obsessive about how you hang your mezuzah, but you can believe whatever you want to believe about the Messiah. Um, and actually it came up because one of the intermediate prayers of the Amidah is for the coming of the Messiah. And um, and also, you know, physical resurrection. We'll actually see that in the Giver wrote if we get to it tonight. Um, but um, the rabbis really didn't really stress this idea of the coming of the Messiah. They couldn't get quite get rid of it, and it's it's in the in the Shmon Esrei, it's in the Amidah, but they didn't focus on it, and it's a very interesting discussion with Maimonides whether or not he really believed it, because although he seemed forced to include it in his thirteen articles of faith, it didn't seem to really inform anything else he wrote. So so it's again the thing one of the things I love about Jewish belief is you can believe whatever you want to believe. Um, Judaism is obsessive compulsive about what you do, not so much what you believe. So just as a way of, of understanding the overall structure of every service, uh, morning service anyway, you had the daily morning service, there are morning blessings. Uh, actually, Erwin has talked about that quite a bit. And then there are, they're called Tsuke de Zimra, verses of song. So for a while, when you get into the synagogue, you're singing songs and reciting psalms. And one of the interesting things is you don't require a minion for these uh, because there's no congregational response. And then when you get to the Shema and its blessings, uh, there, in the Baruch Hu, the leader recites one line and the congregation responds with another line. So you have a response. So since there's a congregational response, the rabbis decide, well, how many Jews does it take to make a congregation? And the answer is 10. So uh, so then you have the Shema and its blessings in morning and evening. You have the Amidah, which is asking God for things. And we're going to be talking a lot about that um, after the Shema and, and its blessings. A bit of silent prayer 
a Torah reading, again, on those days on which we read Torah, and then the conclusion, which is the Elenu and the Kaddish. This is the same basic structure of every service. Afternoon service doesn't have the Shema and its blessings. Um, but this, the, uh, otherwise, the structure is the same. So I'm going to do a very quick overview of the structure of the Amidah. And I know, you know, this may not be so easy to read. Um, but basically, there are, um, as we will see, the next page, there are 19 blessings in the Shemon Esrei. Shemon Esrei means 18, which means at some point in time, somebody added another one. And that's actually a very interesting discussion, trying to figure out which one was added. And I'll, I'll present to you some of the, the theories. But basically, the Amidah begins with an introductory verse. That is the one we, we just mentioned briefly. Adonai Sifatai Tiftach, Ufi Yagiti Elatacha. Uh, Adonai opened my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Um, and in a sense, it's asking permission to pray, to pray. And we'll talk about that a little more, you know, in one of the next slides where we're, we're going to focus on that element. And then we have three blessings which are praising God. One, the first one is called the Avot, the patriarchs. And the basic idea is here are all the really righteous people that preceded us. And we may not deserve these blessings from you, God, but we come from a really good family. So if, uh, if we're not deserving, be good to us because of the merit of our ancestors. It's a concept called zikhut avot, which uh, the reform movement is very uncomfortable with. That the second one speaks about God's might, givurot, and we'll see that that has to do with with God being in charge of nature, and it also has it also has to do with God being uh, in charge of life and death. I'll just read. This is actually from Mordechai Finley. Divine services reaches its historical conclusion. With the resurrection and the day, uh, the de uh, resurrection of the dead and final judgment. So that's give a rote. And as you can imagine, the reform movement is going to have a problem with that too. And then the next blessing of the Shemon Esrei is Kiddushat Hashem, the holiness of God's name. And then on weekdays, but not on Shabbat, there are 13 intermediate blessings. Uh, the central core of 13 requests the necessities of life in order to serve God. And the first six are personal. We're asking God for things for intellect, repentance, forgiveness, personal salvation, health and healing, and a year of prosperity. And the second six are requests relating to the community of Israel. So the ingathering of exiles, the restoration of justice, punishment of heretics, reward of the righteous, rebuilding Jerusalem, and the we pray for the restoration of the Davidic reign, which is the coming of the Messiah. And for, for centuries, the theory was the one that was added, because in actually in the Talmud and in the Mishnah, there is reference to the 18 blessings that you're supposed to say. And then, of course, when you start examining these texts, you realize there are 19 of them. So, the, so you know, everyone's going to be asking, what's the 19th one? And there was a theory that it was this idea of being against the heretics, that we should punish the heretics. And the interesting thing is, if you look at really old texts uh, that were found in the Cairo Geniza, some of that punishing of the heretics asked for punishing heretics and Christians in really old texts. And you can imagine, as these prayers are being put together, there's a huge competition going on once the Romans are gone between Jews and Christians. So the Jews are, are speaking against the Christians, but in order to have prayer books survive, that had to be edited out. Um, the, the, my understanding is the scholarly tradition now thinks that Numbers 14 and 15 about rebuilding Jerusalem and restoring the reign of the Messiah were one prayer originally, and they were split into two. Bryce. Yeah, so it's what struck me when you were when when you're talking about, you know, 
going after the heretics. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is Judaism being a, um, because, because you go after heretics because they don't believe as you do. You see, it's, right. a, it's a, a heresy is a matter of belief. Yes. Uh, heresy isn't a matter of behavior. Heresy is belief. So this actually speaks to a later period, at least to me, where we're trying to keep Jews in and, and maybe an influence of Christianity as far as the tenets of your belief becomes yeah, but, but, important but, but, as opposed to just what you do. But if you abandon the belief, you're going to abandon what you do. If you don't, if you, you know, if you, if you, to put it bluntly, if you go over to Christianity, you're not going to keep kosher. You're not going to pray three times a day. It, uh, you're not, not going to study of, Torah. Um, that's not what I mean. I, I, no, I, I know mean, that's not what you mean. Okay. But, right. but, but what I'm saying is the reason that heresy is such a problem is that it breaks up Judaism. I mean, Jew, inside Judaism, it is not heresy to have different beliefs about the nature of God or the afterlife, as long as you keep praying three times a day, put your mezuzah on correctly, keep kosher, and do all those things. You don't have heresies of belief. But if you have an outside influence that's basically going to destroy Judaism, that's something we can't tolerate. And because the Jews are so have so little power, they have to bury it pretty deeply. Um, whereas in the, in, the, in, in the Christian world, at the same time, you have church fathers um, like St. John Chrysostom, who are writing anti-Semitic screeds that look like they were written by Nazis about burning synagogues and, and you know, forbidding rabbis to teach and, and, and so on. And so both it's so, so scholars believe that in the very early centuries of the common era, Jews and Christians were worshiping together. That they, you know, Christianity, of course, begins as another branch of Judaism. And it may well be that for quite a few years, maybe even more than a hundred years, Jews and Christians could worship together. And the, the church and synagogue leaders couldn't tolerate that. Um, so the church starts being very anti-Semitic, burning down synagogues and so on, and the, the, the rabbis can sort of sneak things into the liturgy, such as this prayer against the heretics. There's another prayer which is, oh my God, the soul you have given me is pure. Elohai neshama shenatata bi tahorahi. And some of the scholars believe that is a very veiled statement against original sin. Uh, mm. But but for the Jews, it has to be very veiled because we have no power. So just so this takes us through blessing number fifteen, the um, the remaining blessings, which actually are said both on Shabbat and on weekdays, are a prayer for acceptance of prayer, uh, a prayer for worship, even restoring in in tradition, restoring the sacrificial service. Uh, of course, in 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 Reform Judaism, it's not going to pray for that. A, a, a prayer or a statement of thanksgiving, and then a prayer of shalom, a prayer for peace. And then there's some silent silent prayers. Um, so basically what happens is this core of 13 um, intermediate blessings on Shabbat and holidays become one section called Kiddushat Hayom, the holiness of the day. Uh, and and we'll see that in, in you know until we have songs like Bishamru uh, uh, and so on, which speak about the Sabbath. But we don't do these intermediate blessings because the intermediate blessings are really asking for real physical personal stuff. And on Shabbat we pretend we don't need anything, so we don't pray those things on Shabbat. We will get into this in more detail. Uh, Bob and Bright, you're, you're muted, Bob. You're muted. Can't hear you. Still can't hear you, Bob. You're muted. Bob, Bob, Bob. Can't hear you. Thank you, Maggie. What period of time are we talking about? In connection with what? What's the what's the approximate date? Of? Of? Was of this, being written? Of when this started. Yeah, so, so there's references in the Mishnah to reciting the 18th. 
And so there we're talking about 200 to 300 common era. Okay. And, but it's not clear when it actually gets written down. It is very clear actually that when we find the, the, um, the Geniza, I, I just ref, the Cairo Geniza, I'll refresh your memories about the Cairo Geniza. When you have a holy book, like a Bible, a prayer book, and it's worn out and you can't use it anymore. There's two options. One is you bury it in a Jewish cemetery. And the second is you just stuff it in a closet somewhere and let it turn to dust. And so hiding it away, ganuz means hidden. So there's something called the geniza. And that was done a lot. Rather than burying it in cemeteries, there would just be a big closet somewhere. And they would just throw these old books in. And after a while, they would just be dust. So they did this at the at the synagogue in Cairo, Egypt. And because of the combination of a very, I, I think it's the combination of a fairly dry climate and salt in the air, because Cairo is not that far from the ocean, that the documents survived. And apparently they, uh, they were really hidden, namely for hundreds of years, no one knew the Geniza was there. I actually was in that synagogue in Cairo. So it was kind of a walled off area and nobody knew it was there. And about in the year, roughly eight, late 1800s, the Geniza was discovered. And there were over 100,000 documents in the Geniza, you know, of varying um, quality. And one of the interesting things is the guy who was in charge of storing stuff in the Geniza wasn't all that literate. So if it was written in Hebrew, he would just dump it in there. So we actually have letters from Maimonides to his brother and, fr and from his brother to him. And, you know, so that's also interesting. But as you can imagine, we have prayer books in the Geniza. And some of the prayer books date from third, fourth, fifth century. Of course, they would have been handwritten, which makes it even more interesting. Um, and so you start seeing this Shmon Esrei, uh, and, and the formats are, are very different. Um, the ones in the Geniza. Uh, this is super obscure. I, I love it when I can mention something that is so obscure, it's hard for me to imagine that anyone's interested in it, but I will, <laughs> that's not gonna stop me. Um, and, and reading this, some of us may remember the the reform prayer book, um, uh, Shari, I think it's Shari Tefillah, The Gates of Prayer. The, the blue one, which had a lot of different services in it, like 11 different Friday night services. 1975. Um, sorry, sorry, 1975. What what I found in the, in this book is there is a there is a prayer for there's a service for um, I think Israel Independence Day in that book, and they take the Shmona Esrei from the Geniza fragments, uh, both in the Hebrew and in the English. So it's very different than a typical Amidah. And sure enough, I checked that I have a copy of it and and it is it is very different so so that's also one of the suppositions of why we have different versions of certain prayers so for example we have a prayer for peace at the end of every recitation of the amidah in the morning that prayer for peace is sim shalom you know and in the i think in the afternoon and evening the prayer for peace is shalom rab and so one of the speculations is there were just two different versions floating around. And when they started putting together the kind of the authorized prayer book, they, they kept them both, put one in the morning, one in the evening. Uh, Jay. Yeah. Uh, where is it written about <coughs> taking the uh, sitter and, and burying it in a cemetery? Yeah, it's actually in the Torah. It says you, you will not... Um, obliterate God's names. What like, does that mean, obliterate God's well, names? Well, I, I can't remember the exact language, but so that so there's there's a word there, and then the rabbis have to figure out what does it mean, right? So what the rabbis say is you, you've had God's name written down anywhere. You can't just erase it or destroy it. So you either bury it the way you would bury a person, or you just put it away and turn it to the dust. But that's the origin of the custom. So it's in the Torah, and like everything else in our religion, the rabbis are going to decide, here's this sort of um, confusing 
statement in the Torah, what does the Torah mean by that? And they come up, I think, with seven different names of God, uh, like El Elohim, Adonai, uh, uh, El Shaddai, uh, El Elyon, I think, um, um, Adonai Tzibaot. Uh, so they come up with a group uh, and they say, you know, don't, um, you can't just throw out or, or erase those names, which is why in English we have the custom of writing G-D instead of God. Uh, it's sort of a, I think, a, an almost, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of an odd way of preserving that formula. But also, you will see in a lot of prayer books, instead of, you know, writing Adonai, they'll have two yuds for Adonai on a talit. It will have, instead of, um, instead of Elohim, it'll have Elohim. So, so you can actually throw out the talit if, if you want. Uh, anyway, that's that's the origin. Um, so as long as you have been practicing, yes. Um, and, and let's take a dot Elohim for example. Uh, they had many many years ago a sitter, and uh, then they decided to get a updated sitter. Right. What did they do with the old sitters? So many congregations, and I've done this, uh, when you move to the new Sidur, you send out a note. Now we do it on the internet. I've got 150 copies of this old Sidur. Does anybody want them? We'll send them to you for the cost of shipping. But when Sidurim have gotten to the place where they are no longer use, usable, you bury them or you have a Geniza. And, and and I would say most congregations do that. And I've done that. I've buried uh, prayer books. Um, actually, you have? Yes, I've, I've buried prayer so books. At, you, go at, to a, you go to a Jewish cemetery, I'm assuming. Yeah. And, and some cemeteries will have sections devoted to burying prayer books. Okay, and when you go to bury those, prayer, those hundred and some odd prayer books, you have to buy a plot. Um, either the cemetery as a service to the Jewish people has a section and they accept it. Or one of the things that I've done is I have a, at a funeral, I will ask the family of the person I'm burying if it's okay with them, if I put prayer books in the grave. Oh, really? Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, cool. I've done, and I've done that. And many people see that as a wonderful honor to be buried with, uh, <laughs> with a bunch of Prayer books are old, you know, Torahs and so on. Oh, my, thank you. That's very interesting. So if you're thinking of that, Jay, put it in your will. Write a note. Uh, no, somebody. thanks. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I got golf clubs in my uh... ear. <laughs> yeah, I've never had anybody buried with golf clubs. Uh, uh, I have seen you're golf sitting, balls. When you're sitting shiver for me, make sure you look. I have seen golf balls in, uh, you know, put in people's coffins. And that is definitely not traditional. And it's because it speaks to Egyptian customs of burying people with their stuff. Uh, Alan. A couple of things. One is when you talked about the Geniza discovering uh, letters and things that you said in Hebrew, mm -hmm. but my question has to do going back someplace around the Talmudic period. Uh, were some of these things written in Aramaic? And Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they were. In fact, probably Talmud scrolls were in Aramaic, but if you, if you know, if you don't know the, the difference between a, you know, correspondence and a prayer book, you won't know the difference between Aramaic and Hebrew because they were written in the same font. So, so my other comment has to do with the Temple of Darohim in the old sanctuary that was a, that A-shaped, A-frame building that we acquired yes. from the Baptist church. Yes. So my memory that I'm sharing is that when we got to the point where we had books that need to be thrown away, but they had the words of name, of God right, in it, right. there was a tiled baptis bat baptismal area in the upper left-hand corner, as I remember, and they were stacked with Jewish books because it was not needed for, obviously, baptizing people, but it was a great storage room. I don't know over time whatever happened to those books but i yeah, remember I, 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 I don't i don't know either and, and i you know it's not a bad place to store books and <laughs> um you know we, we used to joke both there and in 
um, um, in the Church of Christ, where I had my congregation, there was also a baptismal. And so mm -hmm. we used to joke that it's the mikvah in case we ever want to use it. <laughs> um, and, uh, also in Ojai. Uh, also, it was a, it actually was a Baptist church before the Ojai congregation got it. So they also had a... I, I love the mikvah story. Great, yep. thanks. <laughs> okay. So we'll move on a little bit. So I also want to point out, I think many of you know this. So this is, you know, our prayer book, the Mishkan Tefillah. And I just want to point out that in our prayer book, in the Mishkan Tefillah, the way the prayer book is laid out is typically on the left side, as you open the prayer book, I'm sorry, on the right side, there will be a prayer, and it will be in Hebrew, and it will be in transliteration, and then in, I would say, gender-sensitive translation. <laughs> okay? So instead of saying, you know, for Adonai, instead of saying, Oh Lord, open up my eyes, it will say Adonai, or it might say the Eternal One, or so on. Uh, and then, on the uh, left side of the page, there will be some poetry or inspirational writing on the same theme. So I like this, and you know, I'm just looking at the top, it says, and so this is the, this is the introduction to the Amidah, it says, pray as if everything depended on God, act as if everything depended on you. I like that. You know, I'll just read the one down at the bottom. A uh, prayer invites God's presence to suffuse our spirits, God's will to prevail in our lives. Prayer may not bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city, but prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, rebuild a weakened wheel, which is beautiful. And it is an introduction to this prayer. So as a service leader, I can choose to do it in Hebrew, I can choose to do it in translation, or I can read, you know, one, uh, one or more, I guess, of these sort of inspirational writings. Jay, I assume your hand is still up from the last one. Okay, let me see if I can lower. No problem. So now we'll begin, and, um, and maybe we'll just do one or two pages of this. Uh, oh, it, uh, this shouldn't be called uh, page layout. Yeah, so here's, here is... Um, so you know the prayer is called the tefillah, and and it says uh, there it is in Hebrew, and then transliteration Adonai sefatai tiftach ufi yagi tehilatacha, and then Adonai open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Yeah. And then in the corner there's kind of a layout. So I know you might not be able to read it, but the first section on on Shabbat is going to be the avot and the mahot. Uh, the next section is the Givarot, God's power, the Kedusha, the holiness, Kedushat Hayom, the holiness of the day, Avodah, prayer, Hoda'ah, thanksgiving, shalom, peace, and Tefillah Talev, sort of the, the prayer of the heart. Okay. And then there's also handy dandy footnotes, which are helpful. Uh, so reading this one, it says, for those who choose, before reciting the Tefillah, take three steps forward. Um, I think mo many of us are familiar that at the very end of the tefillah, when we say, O say shalom bim ramav, hu ya say yes, shalom, yes, we take I three steps know. backward. What's going on here is the idea that in this prayer, we're approaching God's throne. So at the beginning, we take three steps forward to approach God's throne. And at the end of the prayer, we take three steps backward. We, uh, you know, we're re removing ourselves from God's throne. And the other thing that our prayer book does a nice job of is to note that this phrase actually comes from Psalm 51, uh, verse 17. So it is, as I've said many times, our prayer book is very much a cut and paste of Bible and other material. So this little introduction to this prayer is actually from the Bible, from the Psalms. Um, and you know, I'm, and again, I'm, I, I've been reading these books and uh, just uh, reflecting on some of the interesting observations. Um, for this key prayer, we and we are inviting God to be our partner in the relationship. There's a Hasidic story about one, you know, Rebbe, who said, who was asked the question, Rabbi, what do you do before you come here uh, to to pray? 
with us. And he said, uh, he says, I pray that I may be able to pray. I pray that God will hear my prayers. And so in a way, this is, this is kind of what this prayer is doing. It's basically, uh, I think I have one more little, yeah. That's in the readings in the Gates of Prayer in the Blue Book. Uh, one of the readings before you start the service is exactly what you said. What I yeah. need to do to, before I pray is I need to pray to pray. Or pray to pray. Is that a Hasidic thing? I know you said Hasidic. You, said, uh, Hasidic. you did say Hasidic. I did say Hasidic. I'm pretty sure that's Hasidic. Yeah, no, you, 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 and right. Heschel is influenced by, by Hasidut also. And then a Kabbalistic insight is, I talk about this when I talk about Kabbalah, the meaning in the Shema when we say Adonai Echad, all God, all is God who is Echad. So the central Kabbalistic insight, as I understand it, is everything is God. So God, it's not only the format, which is mo in most of Judaism, the format is, God, you're somewhere over there, I'm down here, let's engage in a conversation. You know, Baruch Ata Adonai, blessed are you, Adonai. There's a you, Adonai, and there's a me down here. You know, give me help, give me strength. Uh, a lot of the prayers of the of the Amidas give me, uh, you know, a good good crops, give me uh, understanding, and so on. And the Kabbalistic insight is we're really talking to ourselves because we are actually part of God. So we we are really engaging in a relationship with God who is in some sense us, and so God hears our prayers and prays through us. So, so it's a very intimate relationship with God, and the uh, this opening phrase is um, is talking about that relationship. Okay, so it's just about eight o'clock. So I'm not going to dive into the avot and imahot. I am delighted to say this is going slower than I thought, so I don't have to scramble next time to, uh, um, you know. I just want to show you. So in this, here's the English translation. Um, there's the commentary at the bottom. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. And it's kind of fun to go through this, but it does take some time. So I am thrilled that we are just at the Avot and Imahot. We will pick up on this subject, not next week, but uh, God willing, in, uh, in two weeks. And on Wednesday, we are discussing, I think we're finishing up uh, the discussion of blessings. And, uh, and we're going to discuss Jewish law, and then Alan is also going to talk a bit about Israel. So, any thoughts or commentaries? I hope, well, I hope you get something out of this sort of detailed look, because that, if not, takes the next four or five Mondays off, because I have a feeling that's, this is what it's going to be like. I think I would say, Rabbi, and whether you're thinking, everybody is thinking about it, is when we go through this kind of teaching, of things that are in the prayer book, when the next time we're in a service, it will it will add to our appreciation of of the meaning. So you're not overtly saying this will help us, but I'll tell you personally, it will help us. Yeah, I mean that's the way I I find it. And for me, understanding the origins and deep meanings, I I get so much out of it. And I'm just now projecting i think the psychologist would call that is that is that true cheryl i'm just projecting and assuming that well if i like it it's obvious that all of you must like it right does that make sense to everybody um, um but but and i think you've heard me tell the story maybe i told it last time of the grandfather at a bar mitzvah where i i basically just said that this prayer replaced animal sacrifice and this grandfather was in tears because he was orthodox and he said, I've been praying this prayer three times a day, every day of my life since, I don't know, I'm four or five years old. And no one ever told me that. Never, no one ever told me what the origin was of the prayer. And he found that uh, knowing that moved him to tears. Uh, Helena. I also think studying it, um, like studying Torah, I love studying um uh, rituals and, and studying what we do at services, because the next time you say it, it may, it may it, 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 there may be an aha moment or some revelation. Yep. I mean, yep. really, 
something to on our journey. Yes. So that's why I think it's so important. Well, that's what I think. This and I thank of, you. This sort of gang of 12 to 15 people who <laughs> somehow find the time to join me Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, yeah. You're a self-selecting group. <laughs> and I, I appreciate you because it, you know, I would never look into this stuff this deeply. No, the question, I think we covered last week or the week before about the hey, hot to feel the, the, the prayer, but it's not, I'm trying to remember, where did we see that? Cause it's not, in the uh, Mishkan Tefila, in the it just says Tefila. Isn't there a place where the yeah? So, so I would say that well, Tefila means a prayer. Hat Tefila right. means the prayer. Right. Um. My uh, and in some in some prayer books, you know, one of the things I always do when I'm looking at this is I pull out my copy of an art scroll prayer book. Okay. And, but but my I believe that in the Talmud. This well, it, it's either called the Shimon Asrei or it's called Hatfila, the prayer. That's where so, the hay is, and yeah. that because yeah. it's not. I was opening it expecting to see the hay, and I didn't see it in either morning or evening service. Yeah, morning, yeah. And you know. this is just the name of the prayer. Um, and as you know, there are three names for this prayer. Fila, um, um, Shimon Asrei, and Amida, and the word Amida means the standing prayer. Um, so, so it can be called either of the three in the Talmud, certain, certain names are kind of like Elvis. You, you know, if somebody's talking about Elvis, you don't ask Elvis who, um, so the prayer Hatzfilah is always this prayer. Interestingly, Hehag, the Hag, the holiday is, uh, is Sukkot, um, and there's another one. Oh, and if there is somebody in the Talmud who is simply rabbi, then it's Yehuda Hanasi. So, um, so I have a conservative friend years ago when he looked at the uh, Mishkan Tefillah and it said Tefillah, he said, this should say Tefillot because it's about prayers. And I didn't know how to respond to that because he was coming from some traditional... No, actually, I think he was coming from a knowledge of Hebrew. So, again, this is called tefillah. The name of the prayer is tefillah. The tefillah is a collection of prayers. More than one prayer would be called tefillot. Yeah, yeah, but but, but he was he, he <coughs> took the impression that there was something uh, that was disconnected in the Reformed Siddur, the way he saw it. You know, it should have yeah. said tefillot. Yes, I, I, I think he was just applying his knowledge of modern Hebrew or Hebrew grammar incorrectly, because it would be correct to say these are prayers, but the name of it is the prayer. So, and like many Jews, including me, we are completely and sublimely confident that our interpretation of any element of Judaism is the correct interpretation. <laughs> That is a mark of Judaism. Um, okay, gang. So I will wish you a good evening and see you Wednesday. If you want to, you know, many of you come both days. That's why I, I don't repeat these classes Monday, Wednesday. And, and then um, uh, a week week from Monday and, you know, and Shabbat. And, oh, I won't be around next Shabbat. Okay. So take care. Stay well. Stay Thanks, cool. Rabbi. Good night. Uh, for those of you who have Okay. Bye.